Hello everyone, this is Cabane the Christian. Uh, before I start, I just want to point out again, uh, my Patreon is below. Uh, any contributions are appreciated. They help me invest in uh, more material that help me to produce these videos regularly. But even if you're just here to view, uh, thanks very much for watching. I really enjoy these videos and I very much appreciate it. So today I want to talk about the book of Job. We're not going to go into great depth into Job. Uh, but I want to kind of talk about what its theology is, uh, what its overall structure is, and address some different uh, interpretations of the book. Uh, before I say that, I want to say that much of this I owe to Toby Sumter, who has an excellent commentary on Job uh, called A Son for Glory. A Son for Glory. And that really helped me understand uh, what the purpose and theology of Job is. Um, so who was Job? Well, uh, some would say, well, Job isn't really a historical figure. Uh, uh, liberal scholars would generally say that. Well, as Orthodox, as Christians, uh, and as Orthodox Christians, we revere Job as a saint. So that can't be the case. Um, some would say he's just an otherwise unknown figure in the scriptures. We can't really know much else about him. He's not really connected to the biblical narrative as a whole. Uh, but I don't think that's the case either. Uh, I think we can know who Job is, and I owe, James, I owe this insight to James Jordan, uh, from looking at Genesis 36. And Genesis 36 gives us uh, the dynasty, so to speak, of Esau. Esau already has a large group of people with him in Genesis, uh, and he's the father of a nation. Uh, that nation is Edom, and we're given a list of the kings of Edom in Genesis 36. Now, what I, want to, what I want to call your attention to is the fact that Balak is on this list of kings. Balak is a character who appears in the book of Numbers. He is a king from that same area, uh, and he sees the might and size of Israel, and he wants a prophet, Balaam, to curse Israel on his behalf. Balaam finds out that he cannot curse Israel, he has to bless Israel, because God speaks through him, and this upsets Balak a great deal, so the solution is then to entice Israel to sin, so that God will do the cursing for them. Uh, so Balak, I believe, in Genesis 36, is the same king in the book of Numbers. What we find interesting, what we find that's interesting is that the successor to Balak is a guy named Jobab. Uh, Jobab is a form of the name Job, and he is apparently the successor to this dude. Now, what's interesting about that is that we know from Numbers that Moses puts Balak to death. Uh, Jewish tradition holds that Job was one of Pharaoh's counselors that was common in ancient Egypt. They would have foreign men serving as counselors in the king's court, uh, and that Jobab was one of the mixed multitude that came out of Egypt with Israel. So, if we kind of put uh, this stuff together, what we find, uh, what we can um, reasonably deduce, though of course it's not a slam dunk, is that Moses executed Balak, and in his place he puts a righteous Gentile, of which there were many, as we've talked about before, uh, on the throne of Edom. And that guy is Job. Now, Job in the book of Job is described in royal terms. He has three friends. What does that mean? A friend, especially three friends, are counselors in the court of the king. Uh, in the Gospel of John, Jesus says, you are my friends. Jesus is the king, and we are on his council. We are on the heavenly council, one of the major themes of John and Revelation. So we are counselors in the court of the king. Job's three friends are likewise counselors in the court of the king. You notice that Jesus has three specific mighty men, Peter, James, and John, uh, and David likewise has these three special counselors. There's the chief cornerstone, is the king, and then there are the three counselors who assist the king in his business. So if Job is a king, and it seems to be that he is, he's the wealthiest man in these lands, uh, if Job is a king, then these three friends are counselors in the court of this king. And this helps frame our interpretation of the book. Because when we understand that the uh, tragedy which befell Job was not just a tragedy which befell him personally, but which came upon his whole kingdom, then we understand what these counselors are really attempting to do. What they're attempting to do is get Job off that throne and so that they can foment a coup. 
And that puts us all in a totally different light. These aren't buddies who sincerely want the best for Job. They're trying to get rid of him. They're trying to get the king off the throne and foment a revolution. So when we see in the speeches of Job some of the really harsh things he says about them being out to destroy him, Job isn't speaking to God in those instances. He's speaking to his three counselors. Why are you trying to foment a revolution in my kingdom? The Bible is an anti-revolutionary book. Uh, <clears throat> so with that in mind, that's, I'm not going to go into detail on the speeches. I'll talk a little bit about Job 38 to 42. Uh, but let's turn to authorship. Who's the author of Job? Well, uh, the author is not identified. There's no consensus and tradition about it. My view is that Solomon is the author. Uh, if you read through Job and you read it with Ecclesiastes and Proverbs, uh, there are many, many connections uh, in terms of the uh, uh, specific words and uh, the way the text is framed. Uh, Solomon is a man of wisdom. Uh, he's a king. He studies the world and he learns lessons about God from studying the world. So just as Adam studies the animals, he gives them names, and in so doing learns a lesson about himself. All well, those animals came in pairs, therefore I also should have a partner. Uh, Solomon does the same thing. We know from Kings that all uh, that many animals from all, the world all around were brought to him, and he studied them. And we know from Proverbs that he talks about animals a fair bit. He talks about the lessons about God that they teach us. Well, in Job 38 to 42, we see a series of uh, descriptions of animals and the creation more generally, and you get lessons about God and his providence from those animals. Uh, uh, we also notice that just like in Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, the Hebrew text is weird. There are a lot of unique words here in Job. This also fits Solomon. Solomon is a scholar. He studies animals. He's a scientist of sorts. But he also is into world languages uh, because he has nations coming up to him from all around and he wants to know how to speak their language. That also fits with the Solomon theme as new Adam. What does Adam want to do? He wants a partner with whom he can speak. God in Genesis 1 speaks in Genesis 2, or Gen at the end of Genesis 1, he makes man his own image. Adam also is a speaking person, just as God is. Uh, so in Ecclesiastes, many scholars think this is the latest book of the Bible because of its language. I think it's more that Solomon was a pretty eccentric character and used lots of unique words and learned words from all the languages round about him. That also fits what we see in the book of Job. Again, it's not a slam dunk, but it fits. The theme of the Solomonic literature is really about God's providence. Uh, each of the books takes a different spin on this. Uh, the Song of Solomon, which has many unique words as well, uh, the Song of Solomon uh, looks at wisdom as a, uh, uh, as a bride. Uh, and this is presumably uh, about Solomon's Egyptian wife, calling her a mare among Pharaoh's chariots. Uh, but that book, like the others, is about wisdom. And wisdom is the means by which kings rule. So, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Job are about the divine king's providential rule over his creation. Proverbs frames it in terms of blessings and curses. Ecclesiastes takes a bit of a different a spin on this. Uh, Ecclesiastes, uh, what is usually translated as meaningless, really, is uh, habel, same word as abel. It's wind. It's windy. Just like in Job, we hear a lot about wind. God comes in a whirlwind. In Ecclesiastes, uh, the world is like wind in terms that man can't take hold of it and alone be sovereign over it. You have to have faith in God and trust him to do what he will with the things that you have accomplished. And in his providential purpose, these things will have an overall significance. Uh, Job uh, looks at God's providence not simply in terms of straight blessings and cursings, but in that things that look like cursings come on a faithful person so that they can be blessed more in the end. This is about God glorifying humanity. You learn patience through suffering and you inherit a larger kingdom than you would have had you not been put to death and resurrected. 
And that is the theme of the book as a whole. Uh, Job, uh, the book of Job opens with a description of Job's property and his faithfulness. And then we see a session of the heavenly court. The heavenly council is the heavenly court and the tabernacle and the temple symbolizes or signifies the heavenly council or court. The holy of holies, the throne for God, and then angelic counselors on his right and on his left. Now here we see this figure called Satan, the accuser. Traditionally, this has been identified with the New Testament Satan and the serpent who was in the garden. And I think that there's no problem at all with that identification. We see this is a heavenly being. He's in God's heavenly court and he wants to do harm to humanity. Now many, pe many people kind of remember Job as uh, Satan coming and pointing Job out to God and then asking to do him harm. But in fact, it's God who points out Job to Satan. Have you seen my servant Job? And this is going to form a part of the theology of the book, that even Satan himself is a tool in God's uh, uh, toolkit to do what he wishes with his children and to ultimately do God's children good. So after God points out uh, Job to Satan, Satan comes and he brings catastrophe on Job. His kingdom is removed from him. Job was a faithful king, just like Solomon in the beginning, but his kingdom is removed from him. Then his, he becomes incredibly sick. Uh, Satan stretches out his hand and curses Job with something like leprosy. Uh, in Leviticus, you're described as being touched with leprosy. Now note in these descriptions the significance of the hand theme. Uh, in the scripture, uh, there's a priestly, a kingly, and a prophetic stage, and that corresponds to the order of anointing. Priestly, you've got the ear, your ear is open to hear exactly what God instructs you and to do exactly what he instructs you. Then there is the anointing of the hand and that is so you can rule with your hand you take a scepter in your hand you make things with your hands this is a way of being a man of action and then finally there is the anointing of the foot which corresponds to the prophetic stage uh, because anyone who is born of the spirit uh, blows here and there and everywhere prophets move from place to place uh, elijah and elisha are going places. Jonah is going places. Ezekiel is picked up and he just flies from place to place. The hand theme is about the king. God is the divine king and Satan says, stretch out your hand and do this. And then God says, Satan, you, everything that Job has is in your hand. So the connection between those tells us that Satan himself is a providential tool of God. Everything that he does fits into God's overall plan, which is why God permits it. Uh, so Job's health is taken away, his um, kingdom is taken away, and then we have this argument between Job and his three royal counselors. Now I'm only going to say a couple things about this argument. Uh, the first is that when you go through, there's a lot about wind blowing here and there. That corresponds with the theme we see in Ecclesiastes, and ultimately it leads towards the vision of God in a whirlwind at the end of the book. The wind is the active agent in the book. It is what takes this stuff from Job, and when God comes in a whirlwind, then God gives it back and more. And then we hear about this character called the Advocate, or the Redeemer. This is a session in God's heavenly court. You have the prosecuting attorney, who is the devil, but you also have the defense attorney, who is this character called the Advocate. This character is also called the Redeemer, and behold, my Redeemer lives, and at the last he will stand upon the earth. Why? Because what you want here, you're in a court of law, you want restitution. You want your stuff back. And in fact, you want double restitution, which is important because at the end, Job's possessions are doubled. Um, and your uh, advocate, 
your defense attorney, so to speak, is seeking restitution for you from God. This is Jesus Christ. Uh, that's the traditional Christian interpretation. It's the one we can see in Hebrews where the advocate makes intercession. Uh, and so we've got this contest between the accuser and the advocate. Okay, so we have all of that. And as I said, I'm really not going to go through all of these different speeches, except to note, remember, this is a, uh, an attempted coup. They're trying to get Job off the throne. Then we have the Lord answering Job out of a whirlwind in Job 38 to 42. The theme of this is God's creation of the world and also his providential governorship over the world. God opens by telling Job to dress for action. I will question you and you make it known to me. This is not a condemnation of Job, but what this does reveal is the purpose of all of these events. God wants to make Job wise. Remember in uh, Exodus, God engages Moses in a kind of debate. He asks Moses questions. What do you think of this? And Moses says, well, this is what I think. Same thing with Abraham. He asks Abraham this, and Abraham tells God what he thinks about that. And through these conversations, this is an example of the Socratic method, through these conversations, these biblical characters become wise. And what are Abraham and Moses? They are prophets. And what is a prophet? They are members of the heavenly council. Uh, prophets have the spirit in them that animates them. It takes them into God's glory cloud. Spirit is, of course, wind, like what we see here about the world, uh, whirlwind. And when God engages them in these uh, debates, they become wise and they become capable of advising God in his heavenly court. We've seen that Job is a king. He has three bad advisors. But what we want here is Job to become an advisor to the divine king. We want him to become exalted. So when God asks Job all these questions about the creation and about these animals, Job becomes fitted as an exalted man who can exercise dominion over the creation, which was the Adamic task uh, from the very beginning. Then through these, uh, uh, these questions and these answers, uh, Job sees uh, Leviathan. Now, Leviathan is a symbol of Satan. Uh, Satan comes as a serpentine figure in Genesis chapter 3. We see in Isaiah 27, uh, Leviathan, the twisting dragon, the twisting serpent. Uh, Leviathan has eyes like the dawn. Remember that word nechash, which can be rendered as serpent, also means bright. And so in Isaiah 14, uh, he is described as the king of Babylon, as the day star, the sun of the morning. So Isaiah 41, Leviathan has eyes like the dawn. And of course, it links in terms of the literary structure of the text. We open with seeing Satan in God's heavenly court, and then we close with Leviathan, who is a symbol of Satan. But what we see here is God's sovereignty over Satan. God leads him around with a hook in his nose. Satan's actions are not outside of God's providential purpose. In fact, in Job, God points Job out to Satan. But what is the purpose of all of this? The purpose is what we find in Job chapter 42. Uh, in Job 42, God undoes the curse on Job. We see, and the Lord restored the fortunes of Job when he had prayed for his friends, and the Lord gave Job twice as much as before. Uh, he gives him the same number of children, but in fact, this is a doubling up of his children because the 11 children which he had before uh, still exist. They go to, their spirit goes to God, as uh, Solomon says in Ecclesiastes. Uh, uh, the text says, And the Lord blessed the end of Job more than the beginning. These are the words that we see in the Pentateuch. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And in Genesis 49 and in Numbers 24, which are about the coming of the Messiah, uh, the text says, in the latter days. But literally, it's in the end. And that word is, uh, linguistically, just the opposite of in the beginning. 
Genesis 1, the creation of the world, the protological phase of the world, then these prophecies of the coming of the Messiah, the undoing of the exile, the circumcision of the heart. That's the eschatological glorification of the world, the creation brought to its purpose. And so when we see in uh, Job, this is called the end being blessed more than the beginning, Job is a figure and a sign of the whole of Israel and the whole of humanity. Israel, whose election is focused onto the Messiah, uh, is executed as an atonement and then resurrected. And God glorifies the world through Israel and through Israel's Messiah, who is Jesus. And in Isaiah 53, there are echoes of the book of Job. Uh, the servant is described as stricken for the transgressions of others, just like God touched Job with leprosy. And that word stricken uh, is from Leviticus. It's uh, it's about leprosy. So, through the persecution which Job endures, God exalts him and doubles his possessions. He makes him a member of the divine council. Uh, God says to Job's wicked counselors, And my servant Job shall pray for you, for I will accept his prayer not to deal with you according to your folly. For you have not spoken of me what is right, as my servant Job has. So, we open with a scene in the heavenly court. Then God comes to Job in his glory cloud in this whirlwind. We've seen that wind is an active agent through the book of Job. And now Job has been elevated to being a prophet, a member of the heavenly council. Prophet, member of heavenly council, same thing. Why? Because... These friends haven't spoken of God what is right of him, but Job has learned wisdom and now knows God directly and as such can reveal him to others. He's a, a member of the heavenly council. He intercedes for others, just like Moses intercedes for Israel and just like Abraham uh, intercedes for Abimelech. Uh, uh, Genesis 20 makes the connection explicit. For Abraham is a prophet and he will pray for you and I will heal you. The prayer of the prophet is effective. As James says, the prayer of a righteous man is powerful when it is working. So the Lord's acceptance of Job's prayer signifies his status as a member of the heavenly court. He wasn't privy to the session of the heavenly court at the beginning, but now he's been incorporated into that court. And just as Job needs the advocate throughout the scriptures, Job himself becomes an advocate for his friends at this point in time. He is like the Redeemer spoken of uh, throughout the book of Job. Uh, now, uh, I just want to note a couple more things. Uh, Job's uh, possessions are doubled to 22,000 and then 22 children, including the ones who had passed on. At the beginning of the book, 22 is the uh, number of letters in the Hebrew alphabet, so Job has a full alphabet of stuff. This is linked to the concept of the Logos. All things are made through the Logos. To be uh, filled with the Spirit is to come to know the Logos directly and be remade in the image of the Logos. Uh, Job now has knowledge of the whole creation, which was revealed to him in Job 38 to 42. And his possessions are symbolically the whole creation because all things were made through the Logos, 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. You see what I'm saying? Uh, we then see uh, Job dies at 140 years old. Um, this is like, uh, this is obviously 70 times 2. 70 is the number of the divine council. 70 is the number of nations that we see in Genesis chapter 10. Uh, and it's doubled because Job's possessions uh, have been doubled. This is a sabbatical and a sabbatical enthronement in the book. And then if you buy what I'm saying about Solomon... This is, Job is a flip side of Solomon. What happened to Solomon? He's given a kingdom. He hasn't gone through death and resurrection. That's one of the uh, themes that we see in the narrative of King Solomon. You need someone who's gone through death and resurrection. Uh, Solomon receives a great kingdom. Uh, uh, God does no curse on him at all. But even though God has not touched him, he's not taken anything away from him, uh, Solomon goes astray. 
And when Solomon goes astray, his kingdom is cut in half. You've got Israel in the north, and you've got Judah in the south. Now here, Job is perfectly faithful, like Solomon was in the beginning. But even though Job is perfectly faithful, he loses his kingdom, just as Solomon didn't lose his kingdom. And even though Job has lost his kingdom here, he remains faithful, just as Solomon went astray, even though he hadn't lost his kingdom. And then Job's kingdom is doubled here. Because he is faithful through suffering, his kingdom is multiplied by two, just as Solomon's was cut in half. So Solomon is a king, Job is a king, but they're contrasting portraits of the two ways that kings can do, uh, go in terms of God's providence. So I hope you've enjoyed this video, uh, and I will see you, God willing, tomorrow.